this transition from my um, introduction time and I, we are uh, getting to the um, beginning of the program. So let's get started. So I want to introduce you to my dear friend and colleague, Kathy Benderschwick, and she is the Chief Spiritual Officer at uh, Advocate Aurora Health. And I thought given um, anything that I've seen in the news in the last two years, uh, we need some spiritual help. So um, uh, uh, take it away, Kathy, and um, hope you all enjoy the program today. And if you have questions, you can put things in the chat, but you're going to get a lot of information. And it's going to be a really fun morning. Uh, we've, we've worked hard on this, and I think, I think you'll enjoy it. So um, thanks, everyone, for being here. And uh, take it away, Kathy. Thank you, David, and welcome everyone. So exciting to hear um, where you're from and the variety of locations that people joining us this morning. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you on behalf of Advocate Aurora Health and our Wellbeing Council to this event sponsored by our Narrative Medicine Group in partnership with the Art Institute of Chicago. Here you'll have the opportunity to write, to listen, and to share stories. And I'm so grateful to all of those whose passion has made this for this work has made it happen today. We are the people we are today because of the stories that have shaped us. The stories that have been shared with us throughout the years have nurtured our faith, enabled us to grow in our relationships, and changed or enlightened our perspectives. And in addition to all of that, sharing stories help us establish common ground and empathy, helps us cope with our emotions in healthy ways and improves our problem solving skills. I know from experience that we're in for an experience today from which we'll get much more than we give. So again, welcome. And without further delay, I'll turn things over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Margie Gitz. Margie. Thank you so much, Kathy, that was very inspiring. And I want to also thank David for opening our program this morning. I'm Marjorie Getz, as Kathy said, co-director of Narrative Medicine Group at Advocate Aurora Health, along with David Tholey. And I'm a clinician in developmental and behavioral pediatrics at Advocate Children's Hospital. Our Narrative Medicine Group has been exceedingly lucky to have established an ongoing partnership with the Art Institute of Chicago. And we are so happy you have joined us for this special Narrative Medicine um, Art Institute of Chicago collaborative event. It's our third event. Um, and we are gonna, this will help us expand our narrative medicine practice. And first I wanna give you a little word about our narrative, pro, narrative medicine program at Advocate and then some logistics. We established the program in 2013 and it has grown ex exponentially since then. We will have information in the chat if you're interested in joining. We also have a Facebook page and group. And early on, our members wrote a mission statement. And I think that Lynn is going to share it. And I'm going to read it to you. It, it took us a long time. Um, we, we thought a lot about it um, and, and uh, developed it over time. And this is what we do as part of narrative medicine and what we're going to do together today. And Kathy talked about the stories. And, and the stories are the center of it. We tell stories. Listen closely, write and share to facilitate healing, rehumanize healthcare, and increase the capacity for empathy and self reflection. We practice learning how to tell our stories and receive other people's stories. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Lynn. We're gonna, I'm going to show this in a second. So if we can take this down for a minute. The way we're going to do the program today is the way we run our meetings. We practice this mission statement by doing close reading, close listening, and close looking during our three times monthly virtual meetings. The event today is going to follow the structure of our regular meetings, which are one hour in length. They're from um, eight to 9 a.m. On, on the first and third the Tuesday and on the third at first Thursday of the month. Today we have a little extra time. In those meetings, we start with welcoming new members like we did this morning from in the 715 to 730 slot. 
and we welcome our returning members. And we do a once around where people share significant events in their lives from the past week or two. Then a member provides an opening meditation to lead us into our time together. Another member provides a prompt and then we reflect and write on that prompt for 10 minutes. You then have the opportunity to share our reflections first in small breakout groups and then in the large group. We have a short business meeting and people volunteer for the next meeting. And finally, we are led out of the hour in a closing meditation. We do this every single time. People report that the narrative medicine meeting is one of their favorite hours all week, impacting their lives and impacting patient care. Today, our meditation will be led by two of our group members, both musicians, Susie Cotter Shapley and Jim Studen Steuben Rao, and we will be guided in the writing exercise by Sam Ramos, the Interim Director of Innovation and Creativity at the Art Institute of Chicago. Here are just a few logistics. For the breakout rooms, the small group sharing part that we talked about, Jean Irene, our narrative medicine admin, will place us in breakout rooms. We will be sharing during the breakout rooms for 15 minutes. You can start your sharing, we recommend, by introducing yourselves, and then sharing according to alphabetical order of first name with an option to pass. Please be mindful of the time when in the breakout room to assure everyone gets a chance to participate. If you have any questions, you can come out of the breakout room and someone will help you. For the large group sharing, which will occur after the small group sharing, please use the hand raised feature or chat and we will call on as many of you as we're able to. In both spaces, it is certainly an opportunity for sharing and listening. And related to that, over time, we have developed some guiding principles and Lynn is going to share those with you. And this really, we start our meeting um, by reminding ourselves of this. And so here we go. We are here in this moment to hold space for one another and for that space to be a safe space the covenant to respect confidentiality, value diversity, and in all cases, follow these principles. We listen without judgments, assumptions, solutions, or conclusions. We affirm by summarizing what the share highlighted, and we reflect by asking open-ended questions. So thank you, Lynn. And with that, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce my longtime colleague and dear friend, Susie Kattershop. Thank you, Marjorie. You've helped settle all of us, I think. Um, good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. I invite you to listen, to settle. David brought us all together with an idea he had from attending the narrative medicine conferences. This grew into what you experience today. We have special guests like Kathy Benderschwick today, reminding us of the blessings that stories bring. And perhaps not just to us, but the ripple effect goes beyond our individualism to the whole world. And imagine what that world will be when it has a little bit more peace. And take that with you for the next few moments, settling in to that peace and sharing it with others even in the silent way that we will do.
perhaps some of you are following along with the words in your mind. Imagine the whole world living in peace. It's enough for us to live in peace with ourselves sometimes. So we breathe in that image of peace. As we prepare for the beautiful presentation, our friend and colleague, Sam Ramos from the Art Institute will share with us. Sam is the Interim Director of Innovation and Creativity Interpretation at the Art Institute of Chicago. And we welcome this time together with art that reflects the stillness of life and also the dynamic, unpredictable chaos that it brings at times. But as we stay centered in our breath and perhaps our hope for peace, we can be in that world that we imagine living as one. You may say I'm a dreamer, <laughs> but I'm not the only one. I'm glad today we're together. And this world can live as one. Wow. Thank you, Susie. If that was the coolest introduction I've ever had for anything I've ever done. <laughs> so I, I wish we could bring you into the museum and have you start all of my tours that way. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, David and Margie and, and Lynn and Jean and the rest of the, the narrative medicine group. You all put so much work into making these happen. And, and it's it, I really enjoy working with, with this community. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to be able to be here again today. Um, so uh, one thing that um, we're thinking about one minute ahead of time, which I don't think is going to last for long, but I want to go ahead and kind of jump into our first, my slide here. So I'm sharing my slides. Hopefully you can see that okay. Um, we're going to be talking about um, disorientation and the concept of change. Um, and how sometimes uh, being disoriented or experiencing something counterintuitive or even confusing or challenging, uh, whether you seek that out or whether it's kind of forced upon us, um, can be an opportunity uh, for transformational learning. And the, the transformational part um, is, is important because a lot of the things that are the hardest to learn uh, require a new way of seeing, which in itself is a kind of transformation. And so what I'm going to be talking about today and sharing with you and what we're going to be talking about together is going to be um, about these ideas of um, what does it mean whenever you're kind of thrown off um, unexpectedly uh, and then you have to try to find a way forward through that. And how do we do that on our own and how do we do that together um, and why is that a valuable experience? So with all that said, I want to go ahead and jump into some art and try a little exercise with everybody. Um, so um, we're going to be sharing a little link in the chat um, in just a moment. And whenever you see that link, you can um, feel free to um, just click on it and open it up. Um, there you go. And everybody should hopefully be able to open that up. And once you open it, what you're going to see is a list of questions. I'll go ahead and take give it a moment there to make sure that people have an opportunity to open that up. So just for a little bit of context, this is a list. Uh, you'll see that it's called um, Who is Your Soulmate? And it's a list that um, a colleague and I 
more fled uh wrote more also happens to be my spouse I see uh, the note here from someone saying that the lake is not opening for them is it opening for anybody else having trouble opening that hopefully not yeah um, if, if you're on an advocate computer it won't let you get in there advocate does is uh, really interested in privacy so that we can't get into a lot of things we can't use google it's a google link so we can't use google yeah so kevin's okay because he's in canada and they they believe in freedom there but we <laughs> okay anyway somebody else is able to open it i can open it in in um what is it oh god edge and it just took a little while. yeah oh. it won't open for me i'm going to give it another moment for some people to possibly be able to figure it open it figure out how to open it and if not then i've got a i'll try a workaround you can would try you like copying me to upload the it? link. Would you like me to upload it as a Word doc in the chat? Sure, if you can do that. I, I think so. We'll find a, see, this is what we're talking about, about this orientation. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll find a way forward one way or another. But I'll give it just a moment while we're, I think, uploading a, a version that hopefully everyone can open up. Oh, my colleague Nancy Chen at the Art Institute is uh, just dropped another version of it in the chat there. So maybe you could download that one. Wendy just dropped it in there as well. Let's see if that works for everyone. Nancy, by the way, is uh, for, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but we're going to have the opportunity to bring a small group to the Art Institute for an in-person experience that's kind of what we do here. That's going to happen in July, and Nancy is going to be leading that one, and she's an amazing uh, facilitator and a really fascinating uh, person, so I, that should be a good experience. But you'll get more details about that later this morning. <laughs> So is anybody still struggling to open it to open that? Yeah, I haven't been able to. PDF work. So I think that what we're going to do is it looks like it's working for some people and it's not working for others. And for, so for the sake of time, what I'm going to go ahead and do is go through the exercise briefly it's only going to take a few minutes anyway and then those who can open it that's cool you'll be able to talk about how you used it and the people who did not open it you'll hear it and you'll get similar benefits so don't worry too much about it if you're not able to open it you'll still be able to hear the basic idea um but the list is uh something that actually more flood and uh my colleague and also spouse uh put, to, uh, put together with me a couple of years ago and we also got it it's in this book. It's called Wicked Arts Assignments. And uh, it's been really fun for us to use with different groups. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is, yeah. And then here's a, a list of some of the questions here. That's pretty great. And you can use these. The list is too long to fit in the chat. OK, so here's what we're going to do. We're looking at this artwork. And you can see some of the questions in the chat. Some of you were able to open it. Some of you were not. And that's totally fine, too. Um, you can just sort of listen in. Um, what I'd like to do is have those who can see the list or see some of the questions even in the chat here, which is totally, totally useful. And um, look at the artwork and take, let's say about two, three minutes, something like that. You don't have to think too hard about it. And try to find one or two of the questions either on the list that you have or in the chat here that you think apply to this artwork here. So once again, just to make sure that it's it's clear, you're looking at the list of questions either in the chat or if you downloaded the list, um, look at the full list there, find one or two questions that you think apply to this artwork for you. And there's no right answer. So I'll go ahead and give you a couple of minutes to do that. I apologize, Sam. Could you repeat those instructions? Sure. 
So you'll look at the list of questions that are in the chat, or if you were able to download the list, you can use that list. Um, but most of them are in the chat here, which is pretty convenient. Thank you for, for putting those in there, Jim. Um, and you'll want to find one question or two, if you get to it, that you think apply to this artwork, the one that we're looking at now. Thank you. All right, so just for the sake of time, so and for context, often when we've done this either online or in, in, when we do it in person in the galleries, which we've done, it's been really fun. We have people uh, go in pairs and walk around and pick artwork. So there's lots of different ways to do this, but I want to go ahead and open it up. Um, which questions that people, you can feel free to put them in the chat, or if you'd like to share, um, you can raise your hand um, if you want to just speak. But feel free to put them in the uh, in the chat here if there were questions that you felt good about. And I see some already popping in here. Which artwork will you kiss in hiding is great. Which artwork do you want to touch with your hair with your eyes closed? Which artwork stays up late writing poetry? Which artwork gives more than a take? Which artwork steals your heart? And a couple of people picked that one, which is lovely. Someone, Jim, said he'd save this painting from the coming storm. A couple of people said to take on a walk, which artwork floats, which artwork will you walk on, which artwork do you want to whisper everything will be okay to. And you can feel free to keep putting those in the chat. Um, it's always so lovely to see these because we're, uh, it's, it's kind of a counter counterintuitive way to think about the artwork. Usually we talk very much about color and you know texture and shapes and you know the things that we see um so in this case you know we see something floral we see trees we see maybe some water a bridge and you know things like that but this this exercise is designed specifically to prevent us from looking at the artwork the way that we are used to um, it's asking us to see differently and to approach the artwork in a unusual or counterintuitive way. But what I find often, and I think this is true of all of the things that people are coming up here, coming up with here. And another thing we could do if we had more time was uh, we could all generate our own questions. Um, but one thing that I that I did whenever I was writing some of these questions was to imagine I was thinking about a person. As you may notice, these are very humanizing. If I start thinking about what are questions that I might ask about a person and then uh, apply that to an artwork, then it helps me see the artwork differently. And what I found is that it's not it's not revealing things that are untrue about the artwork. It's revealing things that are true. If somebody says, for example, uh, David wrote, we know which artwork will cry with you. And then I look at this artwork in a new way and I can see what David is seeing in the object. And it's revealing something that's been there the whole time. And I'd like to think there's, you know, th there's no way I'd be able to see that unless I thought about it from this other perspective. So this is just a very simple idea or concept for thinking about how do we approach things in a new way out in the world, whether they're other people or whether they're something that we're going through in our life. Um, how do we kind of switch things up so that all of a sudden this different reality is revealed that might be of real benefit to us, even if it seems like a challenge or a struggle. Um, so what I want to do, we're going to talk more about these things as we go, but I want to give everyone a chance to go ahead and start thinking about um, the writing and your own experience. So this artwork, I, if we had more time, this is another one that I was thinking about doing, but even just imagine real quickly, you can do the thought exercise, you know, which of these questions would you apply to this one? And that's something that you can always do on your own. Feel free to use those questions anytime, whenever you're at the museum or whenever you, if you go online or wherever like that, it can be a fun way to just kind of engage with the artwork. All right, so what I wanna do is go ahead and lead us into our writing. 
And we're gonna take about uh, 10 minutes on your own um, to think about these two questions. And you can write about them in any way that feels comfortable for you. But there's two questions, what is scary about change? And the second question, what is exciting about change? And uh, you can feel free to write about things that have happened. You can answer the questions in a really direct way. You can feel free to just kind of make lists or notes or you know, whatever feels comfortable for you as you're starting to write and think. You can leave your camera on, you can turn it off, whatever you feel comfortable with. And I'm gonna go ahead and pause my, uh, my talking here and let you all kind of write and think in silence and then we'll come back together in about 10 minutes.
take about one more minute to wrap up our thoughts. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and send everyone into breakout rooms for about 15 minutes just to talk in small groups about what you were thinking, what you were writing. Um, and as you know, Margie explained earlier, you can take that opportunity to introduce yourselves and then you can take turns sharing in alphabetical order or you can pass if you feel like you're not ready to share don't feel comfortable sharing. Um, and uh, some people might prefer to kind of read out what they wrote word for word. Others might want to just sort of talk through it or share a piece of what they wrote, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, and I think we're going to go ahead and send you into those groups now. All right, we're back. Um, we had a great conversation in our room. Um, you all had some great conversations as well. Um, I want to show you a handful of uh, additional artworks just for a few minutes, um, and then we're going to get the opportunity to, to talk uh, as a large group about some of the things we touched on and what's on your mind and responses to the artwork and, and anything else that comes up. Um, but right now I'm going to take a few minutes just to show you some additional artworks that I think uh, that came to mind for me whenever I was uh, thinking about this topic. In, So I want to start with this one. Um, I want to go ahead, since we have, we'll see, well, about minutes or so, I, I, I want to take a minute to, if you want to drop in the chat, just what are some things that you're seeing in this artwork? You can feel free to put, <laughs> yeah, I love her work. Um, feel free to just drop words, chat, or feeling words, colors, shapes, questions, whatever you like in the chat, and we'll just sort of gather some responses for this one for uh, a minute or so. Congestion and crowding, and I saw the word grateful, which is very cool. Um, jewels, a lot of beautiful words in here. Chaos, fruity ice cube, that's great. <laughs> uh, rain, stillness, yeah, wonderful. <clears throat> Just letting those come in a little bit so we can enjoy them. Yeah, really lovely. These are some great words, great phrases, great lines in here that people are saying. Um, so you may have noticed the title already, uh, City Landscape. I think with an artwork like this, you're, you're definitely not required to stick to you know what the title suggests or anything like that. Um, I think Joan Mitchell will be okay with you seeing uh, a rainbow tree, um, in addition to thinking about the implications of the title city landscape. Um, the artwork that I'm going to be sharing for the next just handful of minutes are all examples of uh, abstract expressionism, um, very different styles of abstract expressionism. And uh, you know, this is one that's in, they're all in the museum, uh, the Art Institute's collection. Uh, and you can see this is an example of an artist kind of going through a conceptual process to see a city landscape in a very different way mm. and then be able to depict that for others. So in this way, this is kind of like, you know, the, the, pro, the prompts that we were that I was sharing are not as cool as this, <laughs> but, um, but this is her way of saying, please use this artwork to see your world differently um, in whatever way is appealing to you. And, you know, under what other uh, circumstance would we'll be able to say, for example, Jody wrote here a garden, would we be able to look at an actual city landscape, say a picture of the Chicago skyline or something like that, and say, I see a garden, or I see a rainbow tree, or I see a paintball explosion. And in this case, we're being prompted to use these words and this language and these images to see a city, which usually we wouldn't be able to do. So thanks to Joe Mitchell for doing that. 
This is our second piece here. And let's just do the same thing. Feel free to just switch it up and start sharing some words and thoughts in response to this one in the chat. And we'll see what we can come up with. Lipstick, lovely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> menstruation and I wouldn't be surprised at all if uh, some of these uh, like lipstick and menstruation were things that Helen Frankenthaler was perhaps referencing in her work these are things that you know this is these are artists who were very aware of their kind of identity as female artists in the male dominated world and they often made commentary on stuff like that in their work a chicken running away from being slaughtered that's evocative <laughs> thank you it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can see the title for this one too, if that helps to prompt any thinking. It's called The Red Sea. And even the time period that it was made uh, between 1978 and 1982, maybe that evokes some thoughts if you're thinking about the context of that moment. Right. It's also, you know, one of the amazing things these artists are able to do is that they, you know, they can show stillness, but, you know, these are static objects. They're obviously not really moving, but then a lot of what we see is movement. Um, so Jody wrote The Parting of the Sea, and I see someone wrote Red Rum. I was just watching The Shining a couple days ago, so <laughs> that's, that's, I have some associations with that for sure. Um, but the, the artists are able to evoke action and movement and time passing, even with an object that does not move, um, which is a really beautiful way of, um, of indicating a change or a transformation. All right, and this is our next piece here. And again, we'll just go ahead and feel free to drop your thoughts, barbed wire, chaos, concentration camp. Already. Flowers, some really interesting the way that this is able to evoke different, very different concepts. And it's just the same image. We're looking at the same thing. Women looking through an iron gate, prison, walking dead. Ramona just says, ouch, which I like. That's, that's, that's nice. Also, if we think about barbed wire, and I, and I like the word ouch, because it's indicating a, um, evoking a sensory experience, um, even a painful experience. Someone's asking if the yellow background is part of the art. I think that the artist Lee Krasner would say that anything that we're seeing is up for grabs, it's fair game and part of the experience of the work. So I would say, yeah, the background is, is definitely part of the experience of looking at this work. Sorrow, Tangled Mask, that's lovely. So the title here is The Civet. I had to look up what a civet is, maybe some of y'all know, but it's a type of black and white cat. It's like a wildcat of some kind. I just Googled it and looked at some images and I was like, yep, I can see that right away. But of course, if you look at this, it really doesn't look like a cat. It's really a very different way of seeing that, it's indicating all these other things, starting with this animal that maybe evokes some of these ideas for Lee Krasner and then um, bringing in all these other associations uh, in this image. So no one would probably typically come to this and say, oh yeah, this is a nature illustration, but um, apparently it is of a kind. Okay. And this is the last one. I'm just going to spend a brief moment on this. You can feel free to share responses to this one if you like, but I'm only going to, I'm going to just sort of talk through it for just about a minute or so. Um, this is obviously a little different from the others. This is a Cezanne uh, still life that we have at the Art Street of Chicago. This is one of my favorite paintings. Um, one of the things that Cezanne, you know, right now we have a big Cezanne exhibition at the museum. So maybe if those of you who come for our workshop uh, in July, maybe you'll want to stick around and you can check out the Cezanne exhibition as well. Um, but uh, one of the things that he, he was a huge influence on a lot of the modern artists that led up to some of the work that we were just looking at, um, part of that trajectory. And, uh, you know, he was doing something very traditional and that he's portraying, you know, fruit and things like that. And it's still life and artists have been doing that for centuries. Um, but what he tended to do, and maybe you can see this, is he liked to do things that 
that really took advantage of the illusion of paint and didn't necessarily try to make it look like a uh, very naturalistic, super realistic um, painting, which people have been doing before him. He shifted things so that he could get closer to the truth of what he was trying to convey, closer to the truth of reality and experiencing the world. So very subtle things in here, but you'll notice, for example, that the table is maybe tilted in a way that's a, that doesn't seem quite right. It maybe seems like the fruit, the apple should just be rolling off of this table. You'll see that maybe the plate is, is at one angle, but the, the uh, table itself is at a different angle, things like that. Um, there's a kind of flatness to it. There was one artist uh, or a writer um, who wrote that uh, he thought that the um, apples of Cezanne were more real than real apples. Um, and that uh, there's a kind of, um, there is a uh, sort of essence to reality that Cezanne is trying to get at with his painting. And he influenced a lot of artists who wanted to do the same thing with their painting all the way up to Joan Mitchell and Lee Krasner and some of the um, painters that we were just looking at. And there's this quote, this isn't a Cezanne quote, but it's actually a quote that some of our colleagues wrote for the exhibition. So if you go to the exhibition, you'll see this line and it just really struck me. So I wanted to share it. Um, but that Cezanne approached painting as a technically rigorous yet deeply personal search for truth. And if you read about some of these abstract expressionists and those are people who are also working at the same time as Willem de Kooning or Jackson Pollock and people like that, they often said similar things that it may look like they started with the cat and the painting doesn't look anything like this type of cat, a civet, but what they're trying to do is shift what we're looking at to get closer to a truth or a reality. So it may be disorienting to look at these things in that way, but what we're experiencing is a kind of truth. And so how do we tap into that? And I think that's a lot of what this conversation about um, change uh, is about is trying to find that truth or that stability in this kind of disorienting or um, experience. So with all that, I wanna go ahead and, and wrap up my, my chatter there for a moment and turn things really over to the group. I'm gonna turn off my slideshow. And really just kind of open up the floor. So if anybody wants to share things that you were talking about in your group or that you've been thinking about, you can put that in the chat if that's what's easiest for you, or if you prefer, um, you can raise your hand and we'll take people one at a time um, to go ahead and just unmute themselves and speak. And I see, and I apologize if I get your name wrong, but I see that Shia has uh, their hand up. Please feel free to, to unmute and talk. Hi, Sam. Um, just wanted to say thank you for doing this for us. Um, I've been waiting for this for a whole year because I did uh, the last year, I didn't do the first, very first one. But um, this is just wonderful. Like we get this experience sitting at home on Zoom yes, and learn to think of life differently, walk out of our medical background and just embrace the art. So I wanted to say a big thanks to you for doing this. Oh, thank you. That's so nice. I always love working with this community. It's just such a warm, um, thoughtful uh, group. And it's it's really, I really love it. So I'm glad that you've been having a good experience here. Either in the chat or uh, by raising their hand to speak up. Um, I can tell you a little bit about what we talked about in our group. We talked about a few things, it was really great. Um, but uh, one of the things that we discussed was the change and how it happens uh, over time and the way that time can impact the way we experience and adjust to change. Um, and one thing that struck me while I was writing was that um, we, you know, you can have a massive change, you know, especially those changes that were unexpected. You know, we were talking a lot about the pandemic situation and uh, but also about the concept of grieving and how uh, it can seem like, you know, maybe two months go by and you're still struggling. But in the long run of things, that two months is really nothing. And you're going to be kind of adjusting or responding to that disorienting experience, you know, over the course of years, ideally, right? Because things, time is just going to keep passing. Um, and how it can be so hard and challenging and frightening to see that in the moment. Um, 
And, uh, you know, it's, it's, but once you can, at least for me, keeping that in mind is actually a little bit of, um, is a little bit optimistic, which, and it feels good to remember that. Um, Amkari, I see your hand is up. Please feel free to speak. Yeah, hi. So in our group, the thing that I think we um, agreed on was that none of us has as much of a problem with change as we have with the anticipation of change. It's that squishy middle part that makes us all a little wiggy. And that, you know, when whatever it is, the change itself comes, you can you just sort of suck it up and figure out how to move forward. But the anticipation is challenging. And I, you know, because change is always happening. And, and I think we forget that, that, it, you know, it's just sometimes it's big changes that we're anticipating. And sometimes it's just the incremental things that we don't know and we always adapt, but, and sometimes changes are terrible, but it's just figuring out how to live in that interim phase that seems to be the most challenging. literature or one one our group conversation made me think of there's a poem called the art of losing by elizabeth bishop that is kind of about change and about loss and i think really fits into this conversation um uh i would recommend looking at that um you know you can easily google it it's pretty short um the other one uh, that you're making me think of amkari is uh there's a series of books by octavia butler um novels that are kind of like a sort of a fantasy sci-fi sort of thing and they are but a lot of people really love these books they're very meaningful to people because uh, she talks a lot about um race issues um but also about and and uh, feminine identity and what it means to be a woman but then also um about change and they have a sort of religion that octavia butler created within a story um, and one of the sort of hallmark statements of that religion is that God is change. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she uses that phrase a lot. So you might, um, I'll put the name of that in the chat uh, for those who are interested. But I see that, uh, Mariana, you have your hand raised. Please, please feel free. Yeah, actually, this it leads perfectly. One of the people in my group said, life is change. Um, and, and it's true, right? Like moment by moment, everything's changing. And then the other thing that this prompt made me think about is change, uh, you know, when change is done unto us, right? Like with the, with the pandemic and all these changes that are happening, it's, it's scary, it's, it can be very upsetting, it's unsettling. Um, but when you turn the, 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 the mirror, you, when, you, when you are the agent of change, that is empowering, right? And that is exciting. Uh, so when you can take control of a situation, when you can make the world better through your the changes that you make, there's so much change that needs to happen. And so uh, becoming that agent of change um, is an incredible opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mariana. Um, and what you're making me think of, um, you know, we're, I'm going to hand things over uh, in a moment for our final meditation. We could keep talking for these things for about an hour. I was just thinking it'd be wonderful to gather a lot of thoughts about how do we manage this, these changes? Like, what are our strategies and the little things and the big things and, and you know, that sort of thing. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have time. But um, as, we're, as I'm about to hand things over, um, I'm thinking of the transformation piece again. Um, and how I think another thing that can be hard to keep in mind is how um, transformation, the opportunity um, that lives and resides in transformation and change is can be challenging to keep in mind because the change itself can be so powerful. It makes me think again of more literature, the Ovid book, Metamorphoses, where um, there are people who are changed into animals and objects and plants and things, and it's supposed to be this very a painful experience the change itself is physically painful um, but they've transformed into something that is, is new and different um, and has its own potential and how it can be hard to keep that in mind whenever we're going through a change of some some kind that maybe is painful um, that the person that we're becoming has been transformed into something more wise um, and stronger um, and, you know, it's hard to know that in the moment, but I think often I've found that to be the case, but, um, 
maybe that's a good place to kind of wrap things up for the moment. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we all have the opportunity to carry these conversations forward um, for the rest of the day and beyond with one another and with our, our, our colleagues and, and loved ones and as we keep thinking about it. With all that, I, I do want to thank everybody. And I'm going to hand things over to uh, Jim Stevenrao, uh, who's going to, uh, to take us out with a uh, closing meditation. Thank you all. Jim? Thank you, Sam. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be here with you all. Um, is this at a good volume for most people? I hope. There's a little bit of buzzing. Is that supposed to be? Um, it might help to mute your microphone. Yeah, I, I was I was muted, but is that OK? Tell us that's what you're playing, Jim. Oh, OK, then then it's, it's good. Little, <laughs> it is a little buzzy. So I'm playing a harmonium, and I'd like to invite you to take part for a few minutes and um, a mindfulness meditation. This is a little keyboard that's powered by a bellows, which is kind of like the lungs. So I think it's easy to get into this sound as the sound of breath. And I'm sure most of you are, have had the experience of mindfulness meditation and when your mind wanders, you gently bring your attention back to your breath. And in this case, I'd like to invite you to come back to the sound of the harmonium when you notice that your mind is wandering. If it sounds a little noisy, it might help to turn off your microphone. But I'd also invite you um, to vocalize if you feel so moved. Sing the note of the harmonium or harmony. And just relax and let the sound wash over you.
Gently bring your attention back to the room you're in. And now I'd like to turn it over to David. Thank you so much, Jim. That was amazing. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Um, thank you actually to everyone who's here, to all of the people participating from, from you know, many different places. And thank you so much to all of the people who were leading us today in this wonderful event, um, especially um, Margie, my co-director, um, Kathy Benderschwick, um, Susie, who brought us in with the, that amazing song that was, uh, I mean, the whole thing is amazing. And Sam, um, especially Sam for leading us through this, um, you know, I've just learned so much since uh, Sam has been such a great partner. And, uh, and finally, Jim with the harmonium. Um, I fell in love with the harmonium and a little bit with Jim the first time I met him <laughs> about 10 years ago. But uh, he's, uh, anyway, uh, it's been really nice. So if you like what some of what you had today, we would love to have you join us um, in our group. And they're going to put, um, Lynn is going to put information in the chat on how you can, uh, join us. We, we meet three times a month. So this is one of our monthly things. The next one is going to be July 5th and July 7th from 8 to 9 a.m. Central Time. Um, also, if you're interested in uh, coming, we have a special event at the Art Institute. People talked about it a little bit. And um, it's going to be on um, July, also on July 7th in the afternoon from one o'clock to three o'clock. It's an in-person event. We have limited spots. It, it's a free event. Um, but if you're interested in, in uh, participating with that, um, put then you should uh, send this email address that Lynn put in there. So that ACH at um, hyphen narrative medicine at aah.org. You can say, I'd like to go to the Art Institute event, or you can say, put me on the mailing list. And if you're on the mailing list, you'll, you, you can say for the Tuesday things, which is on the first and the third, or the Thursday things, which is once a month on the first Thursday of the month. And uh, we would love to have you join us as, as much as you're able to. Um, we um, are, I love this group. It's, it's not, you know, I'm a doctor. I spend enough time with doctors and some of us are doctors here, nothing against doctors, but I love the humanity um, spread across a lot of different things and, and the, um, the things that I've learned from this. Um, so um, that is, I think, um, about everything. If, um, we'll stay on for a few minutes here. Um, so thanks again. We are going to try to um, put this on um, uh, on my YouTube account. So if you're interested in learning more about narrative medicine, you can also say, um, you know, you can you can send an email to that same thing and say uh, I would like to subscribe to the YouTube channel. So we have a bunch of videos. On there, and we're also on on LiveWell. If you have the LiveWell app, we we have made some recordings, um, and we're um, you know we'll be uploading those. Some of those are already on there from uh, the narrative medicine groups. So thank you, everyone, and um, I'm going to stand for a few minutes, and you're uh, you're excused if you want to go <laughs> or if you want to stay <laughs> and chat. Um, feel free to unmute yourself, and we we also want to thank Lynn and Jean Irene who. Uh, 
uh, for us um, are the epitome of change makers and change embracers. No matter what happens, um, they figure it out and they act. They just do it really in a most smooth way. So to Lynn and Jean Irene, we send our thanks. We could not do anything <laughs> without you. So, so thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.